thank you again we, uh, for coming. We are very grateful to, to receive this excellent set of, of experts in our panel today. Thank you uh, for being with us. Um, and the way the event will run is I will first introduce uh, some background on the issue at hand, and then we will hear from um, each of our panelists some introductory statements. Um, and then we'll have a panel discussion followed by an open question and answer session with everyone here, so you can ask any questions you have to the panel. And following that, we'll have a reception with drinks and nibbles at around seven. So stay until the end. Um, so I will start with the introduction right away. So today we are focusing on land use in the UK and how to transform it to achieve greenhouse gas emissions reduction to mitigate climate change. So what do we need to achieve? Just starting with a definition of net zero. So the UK has committed to achieve net zero by 2050 and Scotland by 2045. And what does it mean? <coughs> uh, it means that, that uh, we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to a minimum, but whatever emissions cannot be reduced needs to be compensated by uh, absorptions from the atmosphere of greenhouse gases uh, and storage in uh, different forms, which we call negative emissions, to balance out uh, whatever is remaining. So as you can see from the graph, there is a lot to do. We are not on track yet uh, as, a, as, a, as a planet. The world isn't on track. UK is not on track either, but we have commitments to, to, to be there by 2030. Um, and that is needed to, obviously, I will remind uh, what everybody mm -hmm. must know, that we need to um, avoid catastrophic climate change um, that will bring droughts, floods, sea level rise, or the consequences of global warming above, above uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees. So there is a lot to do, uh, but the UK uh, has committed to reach it, and so uh, we are going to explore how, uh, in particular, how can land use contribute to that. So what is the role of land use in uh, net zero? So there are three aspects. The first is that land use um, and greenhouse gas emissions are, are closely linked. So land use can be a source of emissions. Uh, some, land, some land use practices, so sorry, if you cannot read the graph, but I circle in red the contributions of agriculture sector and land use, land use change and forestry sector in the bottom uh, to the total territorial emission of the UK. So this is 11% uh, of the total. And uh, so some land use practices such as uh, agriculture with use of fertilizer uh, will, will release um, nitrous oxide with a, a greenhouse gas. Also livestock uh, will, will release methane emissions and uh, the degradation of peatland. We have also deforestation at the global scale, but that's not a, a, a big issue in the UK. So second way that uh, land use is connected to net zero is actually on, in the opposite sense as a carbon sink. So some land use practices can help to mitigate climate change by storing carbon. So forests, for example, are carbon sinks absorbing CO2 from the air. And also sustainable land management uh, techniques that promote healthy soil uh, can also increase carbon storage. And finally, the third way in which uh, land use is, is important in, in this uh, topic is uh, that while we are aiming to decarbonize the economy, it's not just the land use sector, it's also um, energy sector, for example, or transport. Uh, and to reach this decarbonization of the sector, we need land, for example, for solar energy, for wind power, um, biofuels, etc. So... Overall, the land management choices that we make are going to significantly impact the balance between emitting and absorbing greenhouse gases. And so that's why sustainable land use practices are crucial <laughs> for mitigating climate change. So where are we starting from? What are we using land for uh, today in the UK? So on this map, you sh uh, it shows a schematic representation, so not the actual location, um, of different land use types in the UK. Um, so... I hope you can read uh, and you can see there's a lot of green. Uh, the green is not forest. <laughs> it's actually beef and lamb pastures, uh, dairy pastures, and land use for feed for this dairy and beef and lamb. And on the right side, you also have the overseas land use uh, for, this, for the UK diet. So overall, the, the conclusion of that, of that picture is that uh, the UK is mostly covered by land used for feed and food production, and mainly beef, lamb, and dairy. And it's important to note that our diets rely also on imports, and so the land used overseas to produce them on the right side. 
And in the UK, there's relatively little land currently left to woodlands, which you can see in the top brown mm -hmm. and, and yellow um, in, in the map. So we've seen where we are, and now I'm asking uh, where do we come from and what has been the recent tra trajectory of land use change in the UK? So this is from a paper looking at the past 75 years of UK land use and it's showing the change. So the A is the, is the initial point in the 30s, uh, 40s, and B is in the early 2000s. Um, and then in the top right, you can see which type of land covers have I increased or decreased. So I, I also summarize it in the text. So what we see has increased is slightly our land, slightly urban cover, woodland, quite significant increase, even if it's still a small, uh, relatively small fraction, 12% of total land cover. But a big uh, change is in agriculturally improved grassland, which were almost zero and are now 24%. Um, and the, in the other way, in terms of losses, uh, we lost uh, areas of semi-natural grassland, and in particular, lowland meadow and pasture, which are very important uh, in terms of ecology uh, and uh, concern for biodiversity conservation, that these uh, ecosystems are, have disappeared. So now, how can we adjust this land use so that we both reduce GHG emissions and increase the absorption of greenhouse gases. And actually, it's not just increasing the absorption, but making sure that the storage of this uh, carbon is long term so that we achieve net zero. Because we know when we emit greenhouse gases, they, they tend to remain a long time in the atmosphere and cause global warming for decades, while some forms of carbon storage are not so. Basically, the carbon storage should be able to compensate has to actually be long term to be um, uh, yeah, to compensate properly. Uh, so I've listed some examples of solutions of ways to adjust agriculture. Uh, so including uh, changing diets, so changing also the production accordingly, having low emission practices for livestock in particular, because it's one of the biggest emitters. Uh, also improving soil management, reducing fertilizer, particular synthetic fertilizer. Uh, and forestry, then for, for uh, land restoration, so enhancing the carbon storage capacity for peatland, for, for, for forests, and of course, uh, develop renewable energy. And for this, uh, we need to find uh, best locations to develop, to develop them so that we don't also harm uh, other objectives. So one point I want to make here, especially coming from the Institute for Sustainable Resources at UCL, uh, we always say that we need to keep an integrated view. That's what we strive to do in our research and think of the potential trade-offs between net zero and biodiversity conservation or equity, in particular for farmers, because we are talking about <laughs> drastic changes. And for example, between solar energy and food production. So just some, some thoughts to, to keep in mind for, for the discussion. <clears throat> and so how can we achieve this transformation in the UK? We need, obviously, the collaboration uh, of a lot of stakeholders, farmers, landowners, policymakers, and the public. So regarding policy, um, we listed here an indication of some of the current policies and targets which affect how we use land in the UK. Uh, yeah, of course, we don't know what the new government will be doing. We'll see that after July 4th, apparently, um, and in the, in the years to come. Uh, but some notable uh, changes recently is obviously how uh, we have left after, after leaving the European Union. Um, the UK had to uh, find a replacement for the common agricultural policy um, and has designed this environmental land management scheme to try to give incentive for sustainable land management practices and to pay farmers not only to produce wood but also um, climate goods and services, I'm quoting. Um, so, this was the introduction, and I will now open the floor to our panelists to hear from them about this key question. So, we, we see this is a very challenging uh, transformation that we need to achieve, and so we expect there will be a lot of challenges, and that, that's what I, we wanted to hear from, from our, um, our guest speakers. What is the biggest challenge in transforming UK land from net zero? So let me first uh, introduce uh, the first speaker this evening, Marie-Laure X, at the end of the table there. So Marie-Laure is the head of policy at Aldergate Group, 
And she, I'm going to read actually here because I don't want to forget anything in your achievements. <laughs> um, so, Marie-Laure is responsible for developing and overseeing the policy work program of the Aldergas Group uh, across energy and environment topics, uh, including power system, industrial decarbonization, planning skills, and nature. And prior to joining Aldersgate, uh, Marie-Laure has led a portfolio of complex and impactful policy projects at REN Europe, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. Marilor is an engineering by an engineer by training with a PhD in diamond transistors for the smart grid. So Marilor, could you please share your insight with us on what you think is the biggest challenge for this transition? Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I guess maybe I'll give a bit of background about the Aldersgate Group, and um, that might help contextualise some of this. Um, but the Aldersgate Group are a membership organisation. Um, and it's an alliance of um, businesses, um, large and small, um, civil society organisations um, and academic institutes who um, sort of really firmly um, believe that um, the, uh, sort of, um, the net zero and nature are key priorities for our economy and for our kind of future um, resilience and um, economic growth. And so together we um, advocate for policy change and to improve outcomes in that direction. Um, I think in terms of one of our biggest challenges, this isn't going to be a surprising answer from someone who works in policy, but um, it's definitely a kind of having joined up policy and a sort of enabling environment that can, aim and that can help drive action. Um, and some of this is really around, especially for businesses um, or, um, and, that, and by business, I mean that in the broad sense of the term from a, a farmer running their local family business to um, a large corporation and um, having that certainty and that clarity of direction and um, being able to kind of move forward and more importantly, have a level playing field for those who are taking action. I think one of the challenges we see across the business world is um, there are many businesses out there who understand the kind of urgency of some of this and would like to do more, but they're at a competitive disadvantage if they um, take too much action too quickly. And so if we can level the playing field for them, we can take everyone along. Um, the UK faces lots of different challenges at the moment. We've got, um, uh, we need to halt nature decline and sort of enable nature recovery. And the government has set out ambitious targets in that space. Um, we also are transitioning our energy system and our economy towards um, a decarbonised economy. Um, and we want a more sustainable food and energy system. Um, and I've not even got to sort of housing or any of the other um, pressures on land. Um, and this is something where um, there's, quite, there's a really important role for government policy to join up all of this thinking and to bring together some of the... Um, policies we're expecting at the moment, like the land use framework or the strategic spatial energy plan and how all of this will work together um, where it all joins up, how different stakeholders can engage in this um, and how we can sort of actually go and deliver some of these targets that we have. Um, one brief note as well, I think, on some of the tools that government can use, and one of those is regulation. And I think um, we've had a lot of negative discourse around regulation um, for a while. And something we hear often across our membership is um, how much businesses value good regulation. And good regulation is what can sort of drive action and make sure that we instill good practice across lots of these organisations and, and help with that level playing field. Um, we did a piece of work uh, a few months ago with Frontier Economics looking at how um, good regulation can be designed to consider the environment. And the environment is quite a complex um, system to think about. Um, there are lots of interdependencies and interactions or uncertainty, uh, and it's very difficult to estimate cost or impacts in some cases. Um, so really drawing in sort of good practice and developing some of these new tools to, re to move forward and have this sustainable um, land use framework. Um, I'll I'll stop here and um, see whatever anyone else might want to say. Great. Um, thank you very much, Milo. Um, yeah, I don't want to send a photo. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so now I will introduce our second speaker, Nina Skorupska, Chief Executive of the Association for Renewable Energy. Um, which you joined in 2013, and prior to that, you have um, worked for 20 years for the RWE groups and UK processors, 
across fuel engineering and R&D power station operation, where um, so Nina was the NPower's first female power station manager and, uh, and on and trading as well, trading activities. Uh, her last LWE uh, role was CTO Essence, uh, LWE's Dutch business. She's a board member of TFL, Real, and more recently Royal BAM Group NB. She also advises Carmen Trust, National Grid ESO, and Energy Research Accelerators, and others. Thank you. <laughs> others. <laughs> she is a fellow of the Energy Institute, uh, not the UCL Energy Institute, actual UK Energy Institute. Um, and she received her CBE in 2016 for her services to renewable energy sector and promoting diversity in the energy industry. So congratulations and welcome, Nina, uh, in the panel. Uh, and thank you for, for, for uh, being with us. So yeah, I'd like to ask Nina your insights on this, on this question on the challenges. Thank you. It's not the first time I've been asked this question over my 11 years at the REA. And, um, and the reason why is that the REA is one of the largest trade associations that represents uh, decarbonizing power, heat, transport, and circular mm -hmm. bioresources, uh, which means we look at all forms of renewables, solar, onshore wind, bioenergy, such as anaerobic digestion, energy from waste, wood heat, biomass power, um, for some of the larger producers, um, sustainable aviation uh, uh, fuel and renewable transport fuel. So under our umbrella, we have members that have been working and developing and delivering the renewable energy and clean technology landscape. And um, so land use, whether we've been in discussions across with Europe on the definitions of it and how it should be used in this balanced way, to deliver our net zero ambitions is absolutely critical. So, you know, if you spoke to some solar developers uh, at this moment in time, um, it's very political. So what's one of the biggest challenges now? Well, the hiatus that we're seeing with the general election and also my deep fear and absolute deep anticipation of how renewable energy is gonna be a political football for the next six weeks. And I'm glad it was brought forward rather than waiting till November, because then even though there are some policy and regulatory hiatuses, as we heard from Marie, and um, it's about now that we can see where the different political parties stand on whether they are still, you know, cross, fully cross party support for net zero, or are they really going to show their true colours now in understanding it? And when I talk about it being a political football, it always seems to be an either or rather than an and. You know, land use is not a zero sum game. You know, land can indeed be multifunctional. You know, the perennial energy crops managed for biodiversity, you know, chosen, livestock grazing around wind turbines crop rotations that include food and non-food annual, annual crops, solar farms specifically designed and taken into account to create wildlife habitats, and new technologies that we're seeing flourish in other countries, but maybe not so much here in the UK, which such as agrivoltaics. It's a really popular word at the moment, a bit like um, CFD, which is the contract for difference. Everybody knows this is a really good thing as an energy market instrument, but not many people know what the hell it is. So what does agrivoltaics actually mean, where we bring things all together? And, um, you know, agricultural landscapes will inevitably change with farming practices and the, and the signals and the support mechanisms that we want to see come from a land use framework, which, by the way, I th you're going to hear, we were hoping was going to be published several years ago. And obviously, we're now waiting to see when it actually will happen, hopefully after the party, um, the general election is complete. So we know things change. The way to rise to this big challenge is having the right people around the, the right table 
that can make the right decisions at the right time. We tend to have groups of people who aggregate one single view and argue and advocate what it means for them because it is important to them. If you're a local community and suddenly you're hearing about that um, multiple square kilometres of solar farms are going to appear on the Lincolnshire fields where some people are arguing that's the best use of land is not for solar farms, it becomes very personal. So how do we diffuse that and have a sensible conversation? Another thing that's causing a hiatus at the moment is the ability to introduce this strategic spatial energy plan, which is much promised. Oh, my God, is it so promised by the government last October with the energy bill that the national energy system operator is going to take this energy architect role and come down from on high and say, this is what needs to happen on which bit of land where. Mm. I don't think, we, you know, we're all human beings and it will be a difficult discussion, but it has to be what I would like to see, the right use of the word pragmatic, that Rishi Sunak kind of used as a reason to roll back on, on green energy delivery. It's a pragmatic solution about what is best understood by people who know the land the best that is commercially viable and sustainable and delivers a net zero solution. So that's my pitching post for the start. Mm -hmm. and I hope that gets everybody's thinking going and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Nina. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Sue Pritchard. Uh, Chief Executive of the Food Farming and Countryside Commissions. So she leads the, the organization in its mission to connecting uh, food and health, sustainable farming, <coughs> sorry, sustainable farming um, and a just transition for rural communities and the countryside. Uh, Sue's background is in combined research and practice in leadership and organization development for systems change working with leaders across public, private, and not-for-profit organizations, especially on complex partnership projects. We need this. <laughs> she is a trustee of CoFarm Foundation and is an independent governor at Royal Agricultural University. She lives on an organic farm in Wales, and her family raised lives. She and her family raised livestock and farm for con conservation. So, so, I almost said conversation. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, so please, uh, uh, the floor is yours on, on this question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think you're going to hear um, some violent green, green, green <laughs> panel this evening. So um, Food Farming Countryside Commission was set up in 2017, really as a response to the Brexit vote. Business leaders, green uh, NGO, civil society leaders recognised that it was presaging huge change across all of those sectors. And I think it's fair to say now, the benefit of hindsight, no plan. <laughs> no plan and really no insight into the implications of, of that decision. And so um, that group of people approached independent philanthropists, independent funders, and set up an independent inquiry, independent commission to help shape a new version of the future for the UK, on food, farming, countryside, mm -hmm. and also, of course, paying attention to those other crises that we're all um, trying to pay attention to at the same time, the climate crisis, the nature crisis, the health crisis, mm -hmm. the equality, inequality crisis. So we produced our report in 2019, and our funders um, uh, thought it was okay, which was a great relief. It was accepted across all political parties and across all of those stakeholder groups. Yeah. And then we were invited to, um, to establish ourselves as an independent charity. And so we've been carrying on doing that work since. Now, central to the work that we did in that two-year inquiry um, was around land and land use decisions. All roads in those topics led to land use decision making. And at the time, when we started that process in 2017, early 2018, <coughs> we were kind of told, but just don't go there. Yes, we know it's all about land and land use decisions, but don't talk about it. It is too hard to talk about, and it will just trigger real reaction from, from different interest groups, mm -hmm. different sectors, but also landowners. Um, 
the whole point of FFCC is to go places other organisations can't or won't go. So I took that as a challenge and uh, we spent a good year um, working out how we could talk about land and land use and land use decisions when the UK's policy commitments, if enacted at any pace, uh, would actually require almost a whole other country to deliver them if we were trying to deliver all of those commitments on different tracts of land. We were talking about multifunctionality earlier. That's, um, that was quite a difficult conversation to have in the early days. But the other big thing for us was um, so that the policy intentions, the idea that, we, that government or indeed national bodies could somehow describe policy and it would miraculously happen, um, was clearly not being borne out by um, about 40 years of experience of trying to deliver complex and challenging policy intentions or big, big projects. I, I used to work here at UCL in, in Bartlett, just up the road, and my job here was working on the leadership and delivery of major and complex projects. And the, the hilarious job was just tracking back over 20, 30 years of government major projects and just tracking their disastrous delivery over and over and over, that and like over fun. again. Yes, and I think it was my how we laughed as we added up the cost to the country and to communities and so on. So we, so we, we entered into the conversation knowing that this, this isn't just about what we need to do with land, but how we make those decisions, who is involved, whose voices count, how we shape the nature of the inquiry. And so I think we were certainly, not the first, but certainly perhaps the first to start talking about frameworks for decision making mm -hmm. in the context of land use at that particular time. And what we found was it was, um, it was a bridge away from some of the toxic conversations that we were stuck in and frankly avoiding into a set of principles and processes and, and indeed practices in communities to be able to resolve what are <clears throat> incredibly complicated, contested, um, big, big problems. Um, so we talk about, we talk, we talk about the relationship between top down and bottom up. We talk about engaging um, often unheard voices. We talk about um, bringing in uh, strong data and, and good quality evidence. And we talk about a, 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 pragma a pragmatic process of iteration for many of the things that we need to resolve in the summary that was so brilliantly presented for us earlier. And you were talking about working in a complex system it is going to be really difficult to plan in the way that we perhaps expect to be able to plan. You know, we set a goal and we kind of work through the project steps to get there. We're working in complex systems and complex systems require different processes. They require iterative, they require baby steps. They require iterative and dialogic approaches. And so what we've been experimenting with at FFCC, uh, we're in two communities in Devon and in Cambridgeshire, um, are ways of tackling complex decision making in communities who are absolutely in the white heat of those decisions. In Cambridgeshire, it's about flood, flooding, it's about housing, it's about agriculture, it's about horticulture and where, where things can be grown in Devon, flooding, um, tourism and housing, different kind of housing pressures, um, and, and also about agricultural land use, grasslands and so on. Um, so we've been um, producing a framework. Um, we're, we're, we're very hopeful. Since both governments, since both political parties, in fact, all three of the main political parties in uh, the UK have committed to a land use framework, yeah. we are fully expecting to see something happen at some point. <laughs> Somewhere? Yes. Up here, in the UK? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and perhaps if you, if, you ask, if you ask me about what I think the prospects are, depending on which po <coughs> political party is uh, 
uh, is in power on the when, when they come to give the King's speech on the 9th of July. I'll tell you about it, but I'll stop there and we can <laughs> get into a conversation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. Um, actually, I want to yeah, thank you for, to the three of you for, for these insights. And um, if there's anything you, you would like already to respond to one of the statements, um, and the, or, or, or um, at the same time, we can also um, go in the first question, which is really linked to what you just said. Um, what's the UK's government, the UK government's role in setting the direction for land exchange? And what would you like to see the next government deliver in this area? So we are asking. <laughs> well, I can start. We've, well, as the REA, we have a, our manifesto, which we actually prepared a year ago. We've, we've edited it a little bit because some things did uh, have been realized, and, and it's for each of the different pillars. And through them is that, I would say, the green thread around how land plays a role in that. And we respond to our members now, because we've obviously, when we heard the announcement uh, last week, we put out a call to our, our members, and we have 550 working across all these different areas. So now what's your top priorities? And some of the early reactions coming back, and I'm still in dialogue with many of the larger organizations, is um, just make sure that net zero and sensible dialogue really happens because and and how do people not promise a moon on a stick whilst they're out campaigning i mean the obvious one i can give you a little example of what's happening is um, today i gave an interview to bbc lincolnshire and his question was solar energy hugely contentious what do you think <laughs> and i went well no, so we all know that six, well, do you know that six acres of land is needed for one megawatt with solar panels on a solar farms? But also now we don't need subsidies for solar farms because th this is the cheapest, one of the cheapest forms of forming our energy and it's homegrown. Uh, we can get into the debate if we come back next week around uh, supply chain and sourcing of critical minerals and things like that. Hold that thought. But the, the, the <laughs> aspect there, as I said, is an either or. We do it or we don't. We should or we shouldn't. Uh, and how do we lift the dialogue to be more than that? How do we ensure that in the soundbite period that we're going to be going into, where it's like, do you agree? Yes, yeah, I'll follow you now because I don't want that solar farm or that onshore wind turbine there or that anaerobic digestion plant, that's be, which is essentially a chemical little plant on a farm that's taking all the incredible waste, which would normally form greenhouse gas if we just put it out to land, to make green gas and maybe other types of fuels. We don't want it anywhere near us. So how do we really take some of the things that you were saying that we move past the emotion look at what's the support, make sure people are heard, and how do they benefit? There's one thing I can say from my time of starting at the REA when people thought we'd never have that much solar anywhere, anytime, anyplace. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a pretty rainy country, aren't we? And, you know, we won't make much energy from it. And the, the role of what developers used to do, they used to actually be quite arrogant and think it's my right I've had a done a deal with a farmer I'm gonna plunk this piece of kit here forget the community nobody benefits it's so much more different the community action the approach the market models which previously prohibited any form of benefits going to communities villages towns or local authorities that market model is being bust wide open at this moment in time with the reform of the electricity market arrangements. You might have heard of another phrase, REMA. But that's going at, at one speed track. And these general election debates are happening in the next six weeks. So sometimes what we're saying we want to deliver from a decarbonized electricity energy production system. And as engineers, I don't know how you feel, we never say, 
absolutisms. We said, well, it might do, it could be. Mm-hmm. And in a general election mode, people want certainty. They want clear understanding and promises that will be kept. And so I think the government has got a huge role to play. They have to. They have got to come out of the stalls early, July the 9th, look at what's already committed as a a cross-party agreement about net zero and land use and get on with it. We cannot be sitting here. Well, I don't mind coming back next year and having a chat with you all again. But we can't be sitting here going over the same old ground over and over again. The climate won't wait. I need to add to what Nina has just said. We all, I mean, everyone has a, their own manifesto. Um, but mm-hmm. so we need to shift into delivery and um, start actually delivering some of these targets and having that policy in place. But also, you know, all of the underlying um, infrastructure underneath that, the ways of engaging people, um, how we're going to talk to the public about this and how we, um, how, what role government plays there, what role local governments play in this. Um, and how are we going to have the right skill sets? You know, there's already a shortage of ecologists around the country. Um, we have all these really ambitious targets. How we need to shift into how we actually deliver that, and government really holds a lot of those cards on their hands. Um, and by providing a lot of that certainty, that's how they'll be able to unlock the, the money side. And we talk a lot about the fact that there's no money at the moment, and, and there's a lot of capital waiting yeah. to be invested. And so let's let's give that capital somewhere to go that also helps us deliver all these targets. And I think that piece around, um, you know, the public and we're seeing, um, we're doing a bit of work on the planning system for energy infrastructure as well, as um, I think everyone is at the moment. Um, and thinking about how we can better communicate this really broad range of um, strategies and bits of work that are happening and make sure that um, the communities have concerns we can go and talk to them about it. I think um, Friends of the Earth did a study, published a study a, a few weeks ago where mm. um, they think that only 3% of land is needed in the UK for wind and solar to meet our targets. That's quite a small percentage. And we can also deliver benefits um, alongside with biodiversity net gain or, or kind of community initiatives. Or if it's done well, there's a lot of opportunity here. And so let's make sure that we can do it well. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, like my colleagues on the panel, I think government has an enormous sort of crucial role. And I think the, the first thing that I would like uh, any kind of government to do is commit to a land-led process, not necessarily a departmental process. Mm-hmm. So the land use framework at the moment rests in DEFRA, yeah. and DEFRA has just one component of the responsibilities that we're all talking about on this panel here. So I think we need something that's perhaps akin to the Infrastructure Commission, a land-led commission that can bring together, in the same way that the Infrastructure Commission is designed to do, bring together all of the um, intersectional and interdependent um, projects, uh, uh, bodies of knowledge, (laughs) evidence, um, but also processes to be able to line up all of the different um, challenges that we have in uh, in front of us and to bring cross departmental leadership to the conversation because at the moment it is it is sitting in DEFRA and DEFRA is not one of the most powerful departments at all and yet it's trying to make decisions on something that is absolutely mission critical to the future of the country. I think the other thing that I want government to do is start. Sorry, <laughs> I don't know. Can I just say one? So I'm going, to, I'm going to do a provocative thing. So um, you, you brilliantly introduced all of the implications around food and agriculture, and I can obviously talk a lot yeah. about that. But um, I was a little bit not not triggered, but you know, um, excitingly provoked by the comment that you made when you said, you know, and all these changes are going to have huge implications for farmers. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is true. Yes, that is true. But actually, the organisations for whom it is going to have really, really huge implications, if we do the things that we need to do, take out fossil fuels from agriculture, start changing how we grow food and where we grow food, those are the businesses like the FERC company, the fertiliser companies, like the chemical, Mm -hmm. synthetic, uh, synthetic chemical inputs, like the traders who just want masses of monoculture growing across fields for cheap, 
junk food, frankly, mm -hmm. um, and, and the big food businesses who have consolidated and commodified and financialized food yeah. for profit. Now, when we're making you know, our policy propositions, as we do as policymakers, so it's very rarely farmers who are banging on number 10's door saying, oh, I wish you wouldn't do that. The NFU does have a role. The really powerful voices are the corporate lobbyists yes, yeah. who are very unwilling, at best slow, more often unwilling, to make the kinds of changes that they need to make to the business model that they have built up over the years that has basically financialized land for very narrow private benefit, not public value. Thank you. I, actually, something I, I didn't have time to mention in the inter introduction is the health aspect yeah. of food, of course, yeah. because we are talking about land gen more generally, but obviously food is very central. And we do have a public health crisis in terms of nutrition. Yeah. Um, and so there are benefits as well in terms of, obviously, public benefits in terms of, of health, or public health, of um, shifting towards uh, healthier diets and more sustainable diets. Um, very, I agree fully with what you just said. Um, and so maybe that, that leads us to, to, to talk about the environment more, more generally as well. So um, if, if uh, you, you can all talk about what are some of the co-benefits of trade-offs. I mentioned trade-offs, but there are also co-benefits, uh, like, like the health one, actually. Um, so for people and the environment, which includes water use, biodiversity, etc., um, of changing the way we use land to make Net zero. So, so what kind of co-benefits or trade-offs uh, for people in the environment of this transition? I just, I guess, to start with, maybe the, the, the gloomy bit. I think it's really important to remember with the environment that sometimes, um, if we lose something, it's permanent. Mm -hmm. And and so it's um, there's a there are benefits that we can get from this, but also there's a really important piece about halting loss. And where we don't make those decisions, actually, it will be very difficult or impossible to kind of reverse that. Mm -hmm. So it's not, um, it's not, it's quite, a, yeah, it's a challenging one. And, and the neglect piece is really um, quite stark. Um, in terms of benefits, I think, as you say, there's sort of lots around biodiversity and um, thinking about that. And um, speaking to financial organisations at the moment, they're increasingly seeing nature loss as a system risk um, yeah. and trying to really bring this to the fore and, and get government action on, on it because they view it as quite an important piece where many um, many businesses in the organisation are either directly or indirectly dependent on nature. Um, and mm -hmm. so if we're not doing something to, to help that, there's a kind of economic side to this um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I mean, yes, the usual sort of um, lots of well-being upsides. Uh, there are so many opportunities, right, from from better land use. Um, you might have better examples from their solar farms. I know there's a lot of nice like. Well, space. it's a little bit wider. I mean, I mean the focus, you know, and the ethos, you know, because people who work in renewable energy and clean technology, they're all business people as well, you know. Oh. Okay, thank you. Is that better? Thank you. Um, and thanks for that. And the overall goal must be that in everything that we do does improve, you know, the environmental outcomes. It's, it's too easy just to think I'm working in renewable energy and clean technology and never mind what I'm doing when I'm engaging with the land or using the land. But it is about how we manage the land, you know, and, and what is that biodiversity net gain requirements that are put upon as the stick, which is the planning and regulation requirements. I mean, I think I'm, I'm a little note my, my team put on me is, to make sure I'm accurate, is a town and country planning out in 2021, you know, all forms of planning of organisations needing to work. Developers are required to deliver a biodiversity net gain of 10%, you know, leaving the natural habitat. A, a small aside, I mean, I, uh, you mentioned I'm on the board of um, uh, a major construction and an engineering company. And then it's interesting that they are far down the supply chain of maybe installing the new wires, transformers, 
the, the 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 grid infrastructure that we're needing to see or that's being planned in the beyond 2030 uh, plan that came from the, the electricity supply operator ESO uh, back in March. They kind of predicted to say where do we need to build the transmission lines for all the electricity we need to bring offshore wind to land and come across east of England. Um, and the reason I mention them is they're offering to recognise that, that they have to now deliver to a contract let by these very important organisations who build these infrastructures. They're engaging with the land in a different way. So they have to look at where does the steel come from? How do they make the concrete? What is the biodiversity net gain for the acres of the land that's going to be disrupted as we have to lay down new cables, whether underground or, or as, as everybody fears, new big pylons that are going to be emerging in order to make our energy transition work. So they're offering solutions, but are then the other side of the equation valuing that? in the way that they're not going for the cheap, cheapest chips cost. Um, but they'll work with businesses that take this responsibility significantly. So we're right on the cusp of really valuing businesses and organisations that are really focused on delivering our energy, land and food solutions, but with that sustainability gold thread going right through them. I'm interested in your views here. Um, scope one, scope two, scope three. How many people have heard of this? ESG, you know, putting putting the money where your mouth is. You know, where do we buy shares? Mention the corporates. They will act based on what their shareholders say to them to do. And so there's multiple strands mm -hmm. of how we can make sure that we do get the trade-offs that we need to see by putting pressure people, if you're a shareholder, can also influence too. We mentioned it's complicated and it's complex, but just saying you must do it one way to lobby and get the policy and regulatory framework that we deserve, we have to work across multiple different fronts of the people engaging with our land. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pick out um, perhaps just two co-benefits that um, I'm seeing at the moment with the work that we're doing. The first is working, um, we're doing a big, big project at the moment called Food Conversation, and it's, uh, it's a UK-wide conversation working with a really well-selected representative group of citizens asking people what they really want from food, and we invite them through the doorway of food to start thinking about food and health, food and farming, food and land use, food and climate, food and nature, all those big, complex um, sometimes quite <laughs> abstracted subjects that citizens can find a bit difficult to get into. And as, as you were saying earlier, we, we end up um, you know, he hearing these very kind of knee-jerk responses to those big abstracted questions about solar power, it's complicated, in it? Or it's difficult, in it? And, and the ULEZ vote um, up, the, up the road uh, was another illustration of that, how some of these really, really important issues can be weaponised by bad actors. Um, but when you work with citizens differently, as we're doing through the food conversation, as we did with um, uh, the, our land use pilots in Devon and Cambridgeshire, you discover really quickly that people are much more thoughtful, much more respectful, much more insightful, much more willing to grapple with really complex issues, to listen to each other, to listen to each other's concerns and to work their way through the tough stuff. They bring huge amounts of intelligence and insight and reflexivity into the conversation if we create the right conditions for that to happen. So that, that's massively affirming our faith in human nature at the moment, <laughs> if I'm completely honest, at a time when sometimes that feels really quite challenged. And that has enabled us to talk about, to, to talk about things like not just food security, but food resilience, by which we mean not just can we grow enough food now as quickly as possible as hard as possible, and we can farm hard on the land that we've got, which is incredibly short term and it just bakes in business as usual, but instead encourages citizens and others to talk about what a truly resilient and prosperous future would look like for the country and what kinds of things we need to start doing now in order to give our children, our grandchildren, future generations a fighting chance of living 
living in that so long. I think uh, to, to add the bit that I would have said while so uh, <laughs> chair is coughing, um, is we haven't really talked about the circular bio-based economy either, you know, and one, you know, we, we don't talk in the REA about waste, we talk about it as resource and finding the best use of that. And, you know, there, there is the uh, hierarchy of needs for waste, you know, there's so many different interpretations of what reduce actually means. Yeah, we'll reduce it if it's economic for us to reduce it, you know, and we don't have to do too much around it. We'll um, reuse and we're seeing reuse being used out, you know, around even in the clothes that we wear and, and the various different debates around should you be using, um, you know, woody red materials for paper or should we be moving to bamboo or should we be using it? So you can feel, you, you can pivot towards the best type of view. <laughs> I argue that people dive down deeper into understanding the facts and the science and the understanding of the use of energy in balancing all those different choices that we do. But the fundamental principle is that all waste should be circulated back to land if possible, uh, particularly uh, the, a long campaign for as long as I've been in the REA is for mandatory separation of food waste which really sets the seed for the national pulse to understand what the value is that could be used for land. So that we push out the use of fossil-based uh, fertilizers and we use that resource. Of course, we don't want any food waste, but if we do have it, we're, as human beings, we, we, we still do, then how do we maximize that value? So it's all about the choices and connecting those different choices to make sure in the balance that they are of value so that we do see these benefits and these trade-offs. You know, having a chat with a farmer about just taking uh, animal waste, you know, the, the poop, instead of it going to land and, and causing the runoff and pollution of our rivers and aspects, could we be capturing it and making it into a fuel? Could we then also, but that costs money to change a practice that might have been on that farm for a very, very long time. So how do we bring in the right stick, the persuasion, the regulation, and the reward for him doing, or she doing, the right thing at the right time in the right place? So, thank you. I'm okay. back. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> uh, I have... Have got all those um, I have so many questions, um, but I want to leave some time for the audience um, Q&A. So I just have one more. Um, <clears throat> and actually, it's, uh, yeah, I have a personal interest in that question as well. Because we've been talking about UK and UK land, uh, but actually in one of the graphics we saw that, you know, our, our diets, for example, are using land overseas. And obviously, you talked about solar panel, I guess there was a hint with Chinese, you know, and, and where we source. Um, the minerals, etc. <coughs> so I wanted to ask, what are some possible knock-on impacts overseas of changing UK land use, and how we can minimize this? And I think just a, a, an addition, um, there was a point of competitivity that you raised earlier, on mm -hmm. on, which maybe also is relevant. Um, shall I jump in on the safety point? Um, I guess one thing we really want to think about is avoiding carbon leakage. And we can bring in lots of policies in the UK, but then if um, the food we import is cheaper and is high carbon, that's just not fulfilling um, the purpose. So um, in some sectors, we have what's called the emissions training scheme, um, and, we're, and the UK is introducing a carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism. And, and I think thinking about how um, we maintain a kind of competitive environment for low carbon um, land use um, and avoid that being undercut by high carbon products that are being imported is really important. But sim you know, similarly, um, depending on which countries form those supply chains or where those products come from, um, it's really worth thinking about how is this a lever that UK can pull to kind of either encourage other countries to increase their own ambitions when it comes to environment and um, 
and decarbonisation or support um, countries that might benefit from additional support and knowledge sharing and um, all of that, I think, is, is one of the, the angles here on the international side. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, the UK is one of the leaders of sustainability governance. Um, uh, when I worked in the Netherlands, they were at the forefront of what's called a green gold standard of when, as you may be aware, over the last 10, 15 years, <laughs> the only reason why we can stand and say we are making electricity coal free is because we have converted quite a number of coal-fired power stations across Europe <coughs> to burn sustainable biomass. And that is a very, very emotive topic for, for many organisations. But um, the work that we have done, and, you know, I, in fact, was responsible for a coal-fired power station in the Netherlands back in the noughties, I think that's the period 2000 to 2010, where the Dutch government made it a law that you didn't get, you know, you had to burn 30% biomass with coal in order to start reducing, you know, the net, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from generation. But we have to then also then understand that the next phase is how will we then deliver um, you know, carbon capture usage and storage? So negative emissions, so we can either use this, the land and the soil to do this or we make sure we use everything sustainably and build that and become a leader in the world and managing and delivering those infrastructure solutions uh, here and early but not later. It's a vital conversation piece of the, the and that we need to see in the solutions for delivering both a balanced land and forestry use in a sustainable way and the energy that we need to see deployed at pace. I'm interested in, in hearing your views around that for sure, but I'm not going to shy away from the difficult conversations around what bioenergy is. You might think now we should be, shouldn't use any form of bioenergy, we should might be using it just for sustainable aviation fuel. What do we do with that? What about heavy goods vehicles? and moving them off diesel. Um, it, it, there's so much to talk about, but the science and the facts have to play the fundamental role in making to steer the course that we need to be on. Mm -hmm. well, we, we commissioned a piece of research in 2020. It was from uh, Idri from Sciences Po, uh, our research um, group in, in Paris, part of their European project, which is, which is called 10 Years for Agroecology. Sorry. Is that all right? Ten, so it was part of their project, 10 Years for Agroecology. So we, we commissioned a piece of research that modelled UK farming and food and land use if we uh, wanted to reduce our carbon emissions, um, support nature recovery and restoration, uh, and um, not offshore our carbon impact mm -hmm. uh, and produce more of the healthy food that we need and produce the food that we can grow within the ecological um, envelope of this country, this climate. And it, it was a really, really interesting piece of work. I mean, that, that piece of work suggested a real reduction in monogastrics, in fact, um, the, 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 the chicken and pigs that require a lot of land to be used to feed them at the moment. Mm. And where it's not being used, when, it, when it's not using land in the UK, it's often very responsible for deforestation in the Amazon, the Cerrado, yeah. where, which is growing soy to bring over to the UK to feed mm -hmm. um, those, um, those animals. So, that, so it's, it's modelled on being able to um, uh, uh, grow ruminant meat rather than uh, as much um, pig and poultry, monoga monogastric meat. But then uh, converting grasslands back to uh, those species-rich, um, uh, very diverse swords that are really good carbon sinks as well, um, and um, bringing in a whole range of different farming practices and that very broad umbrella term agroecology that takes out synthetic inputs, chemical and synthetic inputs, that 
uh, that uses um, fossil uh, based. It takes out fossil, fossil based fuels, but it brings in things like um, uh, man manure for fertilization. It brings in uh, rotations mm -hmm. into the landscape. Um, but there was a very, very big um, caveat to that research, and that is that we've got to talk about consumption and we've got to talk about diet. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't carry on eating what we eat, and we can't carry on consuming as much as we consume. We currently produce more than enough food in the world for 10 billion people, but a third of that is wasted, uh, and that is going to have to stop. Great. Thank you so much. So um, uh, time to open to the audience for questions. So we'll have Betty here will really, be um, coming to the <laughs> microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> we have lots of hands already raised. So you'll see the audience. Thank you. Uh, really enjoyed the panel discussion. Uh, my name is Kirsten. I work as an in-house net zero strategist for a London waste management company. Um, so I'm responsible for our sustainability compliance and commercial strategy. And my question really is about speed because, not the fun kind, um, <laughs> because as I see it, net zero is about the risk of inaction. And our policy frameworks and regulations are all... They all prioritise the status quo. They prioritise not acting. If you get to the end of your consultation and the consultation says it's better to not build a renewable energy plant because the people don't like it. And I come from a small village. My mum has spent a lot of her adult life trying to prevent development in our village. And um, <laughs> what I'm saying is there must come a point at which... The scale has to tip. The climate effects are so great that we have to start making decisions very rapidly. And the process will become less important than the outcome. How do we move towards a policy framework that prioritizes action over inaction? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Can I? Are you going to take a few questions? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe we'll take uh, the other two if that's so. Good. Yeah, yeah, I've just got lots to say on that one. <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, my question follows on somewhat from that last question. And it's around what it seems to me is, yeah, sorry, my name's Ruben. Um, I um, will be starting a PhD in sort of evaluating UK land use uh, policies. And it seems to me ultimately, the problems that we're looking at in terms of avoiding uh, climate tipping points, ecological tipping points, these are fundamentally questions of biophysical scale. There are certain stocks of biophysical um, uh, capital or goods, whatever you want to say, that above which we hit tipping points and we, we can't go beyond. So it seems that the framework that you've presented, there's definitely interesting things, especially around uh, you know, uh, information flows between government departments, that sort of thing, I think all very good. But it seems to me that the presentation is one of economic efficiency, as though this is a problem around economic efficiency rather than the total economic scale and the biophysical scale of the economy. Um, and my question is, will, can we seriously get to a point where we shift the system to achieve these goals of staying within 1.52 degrees and avoiding uh, a catastrophic uh, ecological breakdown without actually challenging the fundamental paradigms of the system and the conflation specifically of, of uh, use value in land and exchange value, the conflation of economic demand and and, and uh, basic needs, because it seems without, without uh, proper critique and improvement on, on that paradigm, we won't have a sense of purpose of what we need to do in terms of achieving uh, a system of land use that meets basic needs within the real biophysical scale of the planet. 
um, and we won't have a yardstick with which to actually judge whether particular land uses or policies are um, actually contributing value to that or whether they are extracting value and rents from that from the system sorry <laughs> i'll wrap it up now but yeah it's, it's can I, we I, seriously I, expect I'm to wondering shift we're trying to do a, you is this the theme of your thesis <laughs> Kindly. yeah and we and, <laughs> yeah i guess my question sorry to summarize is can we can we seriously expect to it's an to shift question, the system but, uh, yeah wow without actually challenging the underlying paradigm and goals of the system. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe we 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 wait for the cell because that's when so can you can we just end, take and some answer and then we take your questions. Thank you. We'll take your question. Um okay so the first question if I can summarize was on how to uh, make a policy framework that favors action over inaction. Second one uh, there was a lot of elements, I'm not sure how to summarize, but I'll let you really decide which aspect you want to answer. Thanks. Can, can I dive in? Because I, I, yes. I got very animated mm -hmm. by both of those questions, because they were the subject of my still as yet incomplete PhD <coughs> in these uh, very, yeah, very halls. Um, so we can learn a lot from what works in other countries. Um, in the UK, we tend to think if we sit in a darkened room with a cold flannel with people who think like us and do all of the work together and then present it fully formed into the world, they'll be hugely grateful and go, oh, of course, why didn't we think of that one earlier? And of course, that's not how it works. In countries that make a much better fist of this, they invest an enormous amount of time in what we would have to call in the UK, project minus one, minus two. We don't even have a kind of Prince label for it because you know P0 and P1 is, is already too late. So where, where countries are being much more successful, they have put the time in to engage those communities and those stakeholders, those voices who are often not even thought about upstream, in that process of co-design, co-deliberation. And although that can sometimes feel longer, and people often complain that we haven't got the time to do that kind of thing, what we find is that when people are properly involved in a really good process, right at the very start, in the design <coughs> phase, in the asking the question phase, they are more than capable of... Um, of balancing all of the choices and the co-benefits. And in fact, actually that does go into answering your question. When we talk about paradigm shifts in land use, we're kind of assuming that um, everybody thinks in the way that we do either in the academy or in policy terms, in nice little neat silos. As human beings, that is not how we live our lives. We live our lives in, um, in shifting across all, all sorts of ways, of seeing and understanding and making sense of the world. And we're much more capable of doing that than we very often give ourselves credit for. Where it goes wrong is where we shoehorn people into these pre-cooked policy areas or even you know, academic silos. When you start with citizens, when you start with real material questions, when you start with bringing people together to say, these are the big complex problems we need to solve collectively. So where do we start? You, know, how, you, you find they have such creativity, such imagination. They're coming up with the paradigm-busting solutions, actually, because it makes sense to them on the ground, in real time, in, in their real lives. So I think that that's, and that's not me just being kind of, you know, pink and fluffy and fantastical, as one of my lovely colleagues uh, in the Bartlett used to, used to say. That's me learning from what works in Norway, what works in other parts of Europe, what works in uh, the middle and the Far East. So it's, you know, we, we, we're just far too narrow in our thinking in the UK. I, to add to that, I think on the, uh, on the driving action and sort of, um, there's, a, it's, there's a real note of caution in terms of, um, we absolutely need to accelerate action. There's no question about that. But if we don't take people along, that can become a huge break yeah. and and it's one of the things we're seeing actually um with some some energy developments or mm -hmm. is where there are now you know in some places there's very strong opposition and um and that paralyzes a project and if we don't find ways to engage people and to take people along and to bring in creative solutions and to come up with these um new ways of thinking or new ways of doing policy 
it's going to be very hard to accelerate that acceleration might get stunted very fast and so there's a piece around managing that risk um i I, i'd like to add my uh, old two pence worth onto all this and speeding up you know i can't believe we're sitting here in 2024 and you know we've got a labor party government uh potentially coming into government who wants to see a net zero electricity system by 2030. You know, the engineer in me is going, cat in hell's chance. Cat in hell's chance. But do I want them to take away the ambition? Because as human beings, some of us are naturally towards characters. We like to see that, that shining beacon and we all go for it because we know it's absolutely great for society and it's absolutely right for the world and the impact that human beings are having on it. Others are going, nah, not that interested. Why should I change? People who are making a lot of money at the moment with the status quo go, nah. And they'll actively go against having to change. So it's finding the right levers with the intervention of the government that we deserve. So I would recommend you go out and vote on the 4th of July and get the government that you want in, who will make that impact and create the frameworks that we can see some potential speeding up. The assurances I've got from talking to the different parties are they are all signed up for delivering net zero. That's great, having that commitment. The devil is in the detail of how they're interpret of by how and when and which kind of change curve are they looking at? The one that's going, we've got to do it all now because we're building all that greenhouse gas in the atmosphere now, or the one that they think we can go along like that and some secret, wonderful magic potion will arrive that will solve our problem in 2049 and we're all safe. Now, I know which curve I prefer that action now and the work we do and hopefully the work that you're doing and making the cases and the research is persuading and making clear the answers we need to see. My one last bit about building on this, how many of you are aware of a fantastic project that happened in 2020 where Parliament here in the UK commissioned the Climate Assembly where they got 130 of Are we ordinary people? I'm an ordinary person, but I'm more knowledgeable about energy. But they took a slice right across society and gave them all this information. What an incredible revolution that you had. If you throw in David Attenborough, everybody shifted as well. So we need some totems of people and leadership that cuts through all of the naysayers to the future that we want to see. And food, land use, energy, climate change, absolutely are all intertwined. They are not separate silos, and we have to work together to deliver it. Great, thanks. Okay, so we have a few more questions. Uh, we start with Yeah, thank you. Juan, <clears throat> a question from the Global South. Um, you spoke about scope three. Yeah, my name is Saga. My interest is in supply chains. Yeah. And I've been studying for the last 10 years. When I look at supply chains, I'm not looking somewhere in Europe. My starting point is somewhere in Africa. So it was mentioned scope three. We're talking about this emergency. We're talking about food growing in the UK. Yes, of course, we need to grow food in the UK because things are being very expensive. Most people can't afford it. I'm wondering also, those people are being told to save the planet, whether they should actually spend more time focusing on what food they can afford instead of the fossil fuels. My question, which is never discerned by anyone in the global north, is scope three and where scope three is. Is someone in Kenya? Is someone in Congo? Is someone in Haiti? Is someone in India? What is the life purpose of those black and brown children who are in those mines for the cobalt and the lithium and the bauxite? that we are so frivolous to see promoting as green and sustainable in the UK. Our distraction has been for the last seven months in Palestine. I asked myself this question for the last few months. Where did those MiG fighters come from? The missiles come from? 
from Britain. They donated by the UK. Thank you very much. They are donated with fossil fuels in the fuselage. When is that going to be divested from? This is the thing we should be asking. Where are the minerals coming from for all those parts for the military industrial complex? From Congo. If we really wanted to change, then surely we should be getting rid of this colonial white privilege, which is always conversations from white people only, and actually ask the people in Congo and the people in Haiti who have been completely ripped apart by the United Nations invasions because they are trillions in dollars of rich in resources that we need for the next 50 years for this shameless, disgusting Green New Deal, Right? I'm seeing millions of people for the last 10 years from my friends in Congo. They are being dragged through the mud, slave labor, everything for the last 10 years. Well, yes, we've been rightly distracted by Palestine, but we've not been rightly for the last 50 years had any attention thrown on any part of Africa because we have to maintain the 40 international army bases in that continent so we can maintain our privilege. So we have to give the Africans a sense of perception that we are there to protect them. Actually, we are there to protect our access to our own resources. Thank you very much. The question is, when are we going to get rid of this shameless privilege, which is just to always talk about saving the planet, but not look at the plight and the lack of purpose the brown and the black children have? Because unfortunately, we can't be talking about them because they're the ones who are getting their fingernails dirty so that we can have a green new deal. Will anyone on the panel have any balls, proverbially, to answer these questions? Thank you. Well, it's not enough. It's not enough, but it should be, it should be the centre of this conversation. It's not enough, but thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. So, Maybe I think I think we need to attend to that one before we move on to the other one because one of the things that renewable energy and clean technology is all about is about the democratization of access to energy for people who don't even enjoy an opportunity to have safe and secure energy and that's one of the amazing things and it and it's the force of where renewable energy can go that can bring clean water, that can grow economies and thriving and community projects. And I've been involved in many in, across mm. in Africa on where that is going. Of course, all aspects of a what an extractive society causes inequalities wherever, whatever it is that we extract. And therefore, those kind of levelling up and balancing needs to be addressed. And that's what the governments that we elect need to play that part in that. And we have to make sure our voices are heard for that balancing and up. Not the levelling up we see here in the UK, but the balancing across the world. So, you know, I can't go on about the bombs and the aircrafts and the lithium and scope threes, but the one thing I'm absolutely clear, renewable energy breaks the stranglehold of very large major energy formats. Oh yes, it does. Yeah. Where's the African touch you talked about? I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing a lot of privilege. But I think I think there's a false there there is a false binary though in yes. this too. I think it, it is a really, really important question. It is a really, really important question, but it's also a false binary. Because people who people who live people who live in the global south um, are already struggling with the impacts of climate change, of fossil fuel climate change. They're already struggling with the loss of oh, nature. There... Well, I'm not here I, today. I, I, I hear you. Not, not, not here right now, but since, since we're the panel you've got, <laughs> kind of stuck with our response, really. <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> um, okay, thank you. Yeah, one here and then one there. Hi, my name's Kirsty and I work for a UK energy infrastructure company um, on the planning and development side. So our company mainly focuses on flexible generation and storage technologies with the idea that we're going to have a renewable led future. Um, so one of the issues that we face, uh, um, face as a company is planning. 
and getting consent for these new infrastructures. So especially with battery storage in the UK, because there's not a cap, there's not a cap on battery storage. Um, it is in terms of the megawatt. It is consented by the local planning authority, which, as I think you mentioned in the panel beforehand, can be a very politicised area. Do you think it would be? So my question is: Do you think it would be better if energy infrastructure, especially storage, was decided by? the planning inspectorate so that they can make an informed st strategic decision rather than it falling to the local planning authority where these issues can be politicised. Thank you. So we are running out of time, so I want to take the last question, one here and one there, and then we have to wrap up. Andrew Ross. Uh, I work in the finance market, and my question is going to be for you, Sue. So <laughs> listen, <laughs> quite. <laughs> Um, there's been no mention at all so far about natural capital, nor about the task force on nature-related financial disclosure. Both of these are levers in Absolutely. policy right now yeah, yeah. that are intended to leverage in gigantic sums of money from the finance market, the banks, the insurers, the asset managers and the asset owners. And yet, nothing is happening here in the UK in order to enable it. And Sue, with your model of Cambridge, brilliant. What is preventing, indeed, it's not preventing, it just needs to be done, to issue a green bond for Cambridgeshire, issued by the local authority on the basis of its unique role in planning consent, you have just mentioned here, in order to provide a leveraged vehicle that the finance market can invest in and put the money down into sustainable agriculture, forestry, farming, wildlife, habitats, peatland, bogs, ponds, mires, all the nature region, that all are within local authority control. Yeah, yeah. It's a dead easy, simple solution to the entire problem use the bond market why not well you and i've been talking about this for a while haven't we and it's um <laughs> and it's a really really important question you all all escape group have been running workshops on this for ages for almost as long as we've been talking about yeah. it on on this wall of capital that's yeah. just waiting to pour in well you know if we have to wait much longer i will have I'm visibly aged, visibly aged in those those last six years, and I think it's because there are there are actually some serious issues that need to be resolved at, at the moment. I mean, the biodiversity net gain market is a case in is a case in point. It's already being gamed, yeah. and it's already being gamed in ways that are really detrimental to nature and indeed communities. What we're doing in Wales, we're working on a project in Wales at the moment with Welsh Government and Welsh Farmers, is to look at how we can mutualise natural capital payments for exactly the, the reasons that you described there. So it's not just a private transaction between, and it's a very um, as, you know, asymmetric transaction between you know, people who are really, really skilled at financialising uh, products and commodities and farmers and landowners who are perhaps you know, absolutely on their uppers, have no confidence in the future at the moment and don't know what to do first or next. And in Wales particularly, the, the conversation comes into sharp relief as you know, British Airways and private equity start to buy up farmland, you know, remove farmers from farming communities. And that's often where the culture resides, where the language resides. And they're really denuding and depleting whole communities for, um, you know, uh, for, for, their, for, their, own, for their own purposes. Um, all of that does need to work through. So. Um, so if I'm really honest, I'm still a bit ambivalent about, about natural capital. I, what, I, what I would really like to see are the vehicles that you know, we talk about, which is um, ve vehicles that have really clear boundaries for public value, guardrails for public value. So it's not just a kind of you know, um, extractive process. So you know, whoever's got the most money and the biggest voice can just... you know colonise land in the UK and remove communities from the land in the UK and likely meet very, very narrow sets of purposes. So 
I mean, this is worthy. You've been doing for ages, isn't it? it yes. Um, I think the there's a real. Um, it's new, and so the doing the policy development in itself is it's a novel thing, and we need to make sure that we're iterating and that we're learning lessons as we roll things out. So with BNG, you know, unintended consequences start coming up. Maybe they could have been predicted if people had thought about them beforehand. Maybe not, but. Um, but I think we need to make sure that we're learning those lessons and we're bringing them up um, along the way. Um, there are also organisations doing really interesting stuff in this space, like Finance Earth, for example, who think about how do you get capital in some of these projects that do have kind of um, society and nature benefit. Um, and again, you know, we can learn what works there, what can we do, work in government for those levers and um, on, you know, um, nature related disclosures. It's been a real challenge getting government to see the value of mandating them. And part of that is because we've had a context where um, regulating and forcing businesses to do something is not, you know, the, the view of the current government. And um, maybe that will change with an election, who knows. But I think finding ways of getting these things <coughs> into boardroom discussions and making them a priority is, you know, one angle to this as well. And it's developing that whole system around it that is... Yeah, it's an iterative process. The, the task force for nature related financial mm -hmm. has got huge support in the city and all worldwide. Huge support. Huge, yeah. huge. Yeah, I know. They can't find the project in the UK to put the money into. Cambridge is the perfect long. It's it's a it's a really really good example, isn't it? That you, you kind of need to you need to to wrap um you need to put a wrapper around oh. a topic to make it to make it um. Well, to make it a topic, like we did with the Infrastructure Commission. Infrastructure was a thing that was in all sorts of different places. By creating the Infrastructure Commission, it became a thing. Mm. It became a thing that could be understood as a whole. So why we talk about the Land Commission. We make land, we centre land. Um, and I think we, it's, it's the same sort of challenge. Until we, until we kind of centre that as, as the topic, we end up you know, dancing all around the edges of it. I think it's very, very... Uh Finance is the biggest lever that will make change happen. I've had the good fortune to attend the last three COPs, you know, in uh, obviously in Glasgow, where that's when the UK came out as the huge terror and the ex bank of uh, governor of the Bank of England was really Mark Carney was championing all of this. And then we felt the slump when we were in Sharm El Sheikh, when people were beginning to realise that um, all the different claims of carbon credits and carbon markets and, and trading and, and accounting systems, it was being gained and it's being played. And the last thing we want to see, I mean, the, 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 the real gauntlet was thrown down at the last COP to say, when people go to Azerbaijan, and let's not go into the question, why is it in Azerbaijan? Um, we really must have the rules around how the money is used. But I have to say, we're what? That will be 2024. And again, we need it to be good enough, the rules. Yeah. Not absolutely perfect. But people will poke at the point where if money is spent badly, on things called green, as we heard from an earlier conversation. You can extrapolate the bad story out of nearly anything. And when it comes to money, people will focus on it where it's spent. Can I tackle the battery one? Of course. Planning, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think it's bonkers that you can have um, a, a really extraordinary technology that's evolved over the last five, six years and we've been working hard in the UK to demonstrate the different markets of the ways of making it happen. And it's one of the key topic areas, even though it's maybe a two or a four hour play, uh, you know, short term uh, energy storage rather than the medium and the longer duration energy storage, that combined with a solar farm or a, an onshore wind, we can see that smoothing out in delivery of power in a more secure way that we can predict. Uh, it's a, everything that's happening around planning is a human construct. It's got to be within our power to sort this out. We argued eight years ago for storage to have its own definition of, a, of a, an enabler, 
It's not a generation and it's not a demand source. It's a unique interplay between how we can manage our energy. Yet the government took the chicken way out and just labelled it generation. And it's now landed and loaded with all of that baggage and we need to sort it out. Yes. Thank you. So there were a few more questions, but we are running over time. So I think we, I suggest we ask the panel during the reception for a little question. So uh, before closing, I just want to give you an uh, opportunity for a brief on the river. Very brief. And then you can develop in the, in the reception. <laughs> I have just lots of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Nice and brief. <laughs> I'm fairly confident that um, if, if we have the government that polls suggest we will, that this is very, very high mm. on their agenda. And, um, and I'm looking forward to doing that work. I think um, my comment is that if we've got the right government and we now recognise that we cannot work independently in separate sectors, as we classically used to do our separate swim lanes, is a way of describing it. We all have to be working in concert to get to the end goal together. And that's one of the things I love about the REA. We, we, we try to break down those individual barriers between technologies, cross power heat, transport and circular barrier resources. But we know we have to do work even wider right across the farming, food, land use, and our, even our urban development and what that infrastructure is going to be providing us. So. Mm -hmm. Let's break down those barriers. Great. Um, thank you very much again to our three excellent families for accepting uh, this invitation this evening and for all your insights. I want to also thank Cassie uh, Page, ISR Policy Manager, for organizing the event and uh, the COMS team for their support. And thank you all for coming and for your questions. And please join us in the drinks and, and conversation for the reception. And if you click to check uh, our website, we all know about a lot of the research we do here. Thank you very much. Thank you.